Well, good morning. It's me, Kenny Polcari, your host of the party. And today is Friday, June 7th, 2024. And as you can see, it is another spectacular day here in South Florida. The sun is out, the sky is blue, the markets are kind of churning, not sure which way to go. So here are the things you need to know to get your day started. Well, the pressure is on. JJ is up next. NFP report comes out today. Let's see what happens. The eco data is favoring now a sooner rather than later narrative, right? But be careful what you wish for. Remember, we discussed that why they're cutting rates. Oil churns, gold is struggling to hold the trend line, and bonds are just taking a breather. And what do we have for dinner tonight? We're going to have the summer shepherd salad. Simple to make, but it's good all summer long. Goes with a range of dishes so you can make it over and over. So yesterday reminded me of the Freddie Mercury, David Bowie under pressure, right? Originally sung in 1981, but then re-released in 1982 on the Queen album, Hot Space, becoming Queen's second number one hit and Bowie's third. The song being described by some as a monster rock track that, uh, that stood out in an incredibly powerful and poignant pop song. And it is, it was, and it is, and it continues to be so today. The song goes on to describe the pressure that we all feel causing a state of anxiety that comes from all the difficulties and effort it takes to be a central banker. Yeah, okay, I changed that part of the song, but it's true because the pressure for JJ is on. What will he do now? Right? Recall on Wednesday, we got the Bank of Canada cut their rates by 25 basis points. Yesterday, we got the ECB and the Riksbank, which is Sweden, cut their rates by 25 basis points, leaving JJ, who's usually in the lead role in the drama, now in a supporting actor position. Will he definitively announce the long-awaited rate cut, or will he remain coy? Right? The find is cute and playful next week, leaving any, uh, any cut unclear as to timing not to as to whether it's happening just about timing we all know it's coming we just don't know when and that's what the speculation is all about and if today's data is weaker then i even think he has cover to move on rates this year right remember i'm in the no cut camp but you could change my mind and let's not overthink this a 25 basis point rate cut is not a one percent rate cut and it still leaves us at five percent rates which is really historically normal a look at yesterday's performance is non-committal. Stock stalled, uh, with traders refraining from making any really big bets other than apparently Roaring Kitty. We'll talk about that more in a minute. The Dow up 78 points, the S&P was down one, the NASDAQ down 15, the Russell down 14, the Transport down 42, while the equal weighted S&P lost 14 points. This week's eco data now putting more pressure on JJ and the Fed while giving the no rate cut narrative guys a run for their money, including me, right? Manufacturing PMIs, prices paid PMIs, JOLT report, ADP employment, services PMIs, services prices paid CMIs, uh, PMIs, uh, ISM employment, factory orders, uh, durable goods orders, all pointing to a slowing economy. And then we got two more data points yesterday that I told you were the ones to watch. We got unit labor costs, right? They came in at plus 4%, which is down from 4.7% last month and below the estimate of 4.9%, right? So that's bullish because it speaks to the cost of labor per unit. A declining number indicates that the labor market is becoming less expensive, and that speaks to the level of inflation. And then the all-important challenger job cuts, which came in a whopping negative 20.3, which is really bullish as well, as it speaks to the potential of planned future layoffs and the negative number being seen as a positive because it suggests less layoffs, right? So some stability in the economy. Now you can see that in yesterday's note, I talked all about it. Now both of these data points are offering further proof of maybe a slowing and cooling economy. Now, all this new data, all this new data does is throw uh, the whole strong economy and higher for longer narrative into a cooling economy, maybe sooner rather than later narrative, right? But it does not convince us yet that it's gonna help the inflation story. Recall the rise in PPI last month has the potential to keep the inflation story alive and well this month. Well, maybe not. We're gonna find out next week. Today, though, just might be the deciding factor in what the newest narrative will be when JJ presents next Wednesday, post the FOMC meeting that begins on Tuesday and then ends at Wednesday at two o'clock where we get the announcement, and then 2.30 we get the press conference. There is some, uh, there is some um, going way out on a limb here, saying that, that uh, JJ could surprise us and announce a cut next Wednesday. Look, 
for a story, look for a story over the weekend or Monday uh, out of the Wall Street Journal and Nikki T, right? Because that's going to be the telltale sign. I, my gut says June is not happening, so I don't think there's any surprise happening. But could he intimate July? I think a 5% chance. JP Morgan and Citibank are supporting a July uh, cut. September, 5%. November, I think 35%. December, I think 35% chance that he announces that or he intimates that. And a 2020 move, I still think is a 20% opportunity. FYI, the futures markets are pricing in a 70% chance of a November rate cut now and an 80% chance of a December rate cut. So they're calling for two cuts. Today's all about the May non-farm payroll report, right? And there's a lot riding on the data this morning, right? A lot riding on it. Questions include, will it support all the other data points this week? Or is it going to stand by itself? Will payrolls grow by 180,000 jobs or will they surprise to the downside or the upside? Will unemployment become a 4% number or not, right? Expectations are still for 3.9%. But remember, JJ needs to see it rise while the Bidens want to see it decline. And finally, what happens to the average hourly earnings month over month and year over year? Will they come in in line or will they be weaker or hotter, right? Depending on uh, if they're weaker, it's less inflationary, hotter than more inflationary. Now, if the job creation number is higher, say maybe with a two handle on it, would that necessarily kill the cut idea? Usually it would, but according to the data, wage growth is cooling. So even if job creation is rising, wage growth tells us that employers are taking back control and they're not, uh, and they're happy to employ you, but they're not getting crazy on wages in a kind of take it or leave it option, which again speaks to, uh, to time, which again speaks to trying to time the markets versus time in the markets for long-term investors, right? And if the job creation number is weaker, does that force the Fed to go into panic mode and cut in a knee-jerk reaction? Remember what we discussed, a panic rate cut sends a very different message to the markets. So my guess is they're not gonna panic. I don't think they're gonna panic at all, but let's see what next week's CPI and PPI data have to say. Now, oil remains below the trend line, has recouped about 4.5% of the recent losses, right? It's down about 10% off the highs. Uh, it's now trading at 75.60 and remains in the 70.80 trading range, right? I don't think there's anything that's gonna push us one way or the other out of that range at the moment. Gold also continues to churn in the 2300, 2400 range, right? This morning, it's right in the middle at 2355, where it's kind of been. Um, it is down 36 points from the rally we saw two days ago, uh, as it too remains in this tight trading range, waiting for more clarity. Bonds did nothing really after a rather busy week. Saw the TLT and the TLH rally by better than 5%. We may see more action today after the NFP report, a weaker number surely supporting the, the rate cut narrative, while a slightly stronger number, say better than 200,000, uh, uh, is not expected to cause much concern. I would argue that a number higher than the low twos, you know, 220, 230, will cause us uh, to remain on pause for at least another month. Now, futures this morning are flat. Dow down 11, S&P's unchanged, and NASDAQ's up 25, or the Russell is unchanged. Besides the NFP report, Roaring Kitty is back on the scene, hosting a live YouTube session today. Uh, during during the trading day, right? And the meme stocks are going absolutely ballistic. GME is up 34% in the pre-market, which could make him a billionaire if his positions are real, which is to be verified today. AMC up 11%, Holo up 16%, BlackBerry up 6%, FIFE, I don't even know what that one is, up 22%. Cracking up 13%. Now, there are all kinds of chatter at E-Trade and the SEC, and I'm sure at Robinhood as well, about what to do with Roaring Kitty. Is he breaking any laws? Is he forcing people to trade these stocks? Is he not allowed to trade his own money? Is he not allowed to dis disclose his positions? Every institution discloses their positions. All you have to do is look it up on Bloomberg. Vanguard owns 36 million shares of GME. BlackRock owns 22 million shares of GME. State Street owns 8 million shares of GME. Northern Trust, which is usually a very stoic firm, they even own 2 million shares of, of GME. So the question is, are you buying stocks based on what those big institutions are doing? Because they advertise it. So what's the issue if you are? Right, because you're doing the same with Roaring Kitty. If you choose to mimic him, then you choose to mimic him. No one's holding a gun to your head, right? It's all about risk and reward, and that is up to you. Trading is for the big boys. Boys being used here in an all-inclusive manner. You either know what you're doing or you don't. I just don't see how anyone can ban him or fine him for being a YouTube personality that people follow. It's the world we live in today. Have you heard of TikTok? 
Okay, come on, man. The industry worried, uh, if the industry's worried about lawsuits from inexperienced traders that need to blame someone if they go belly up, then don't let them trade without the proper education. Verify that they know what they're doing. Make them sign a waiver that says, I know what I'm doing. The industry brought this on themselves, by the way, by democratizing the process and opening the doors to anybody that wants to trade. This is just one of those unintended consequences. They could talk about this all day, and I suspect they're gonna talk about it all day. European markets are all a bit lower. Think profit-taking after the rally that we saw going into yesterday on the expected ECB rate cut, even in the face of nagging inflation. Germany reports that their economy expanded only by three-tenths of a percent, below the prior estimate of four-tenths, all while inflation ticks slightly higher. Markets across the zone are all down between eh, four-tenths and eight-tenths of a percent. Not dramatic, but they're just pulling back, again, on profit-taking. Yesterday, the S&P lost one point after making a, a new high the day before. Today's eco data is certainly gonna drive the action in the broader market. Roaring Kitty will drive the action in the meme stocks. Roaring Kitty is, has no effect on Honeywell, Coke, Johnson & Johnson, or any of the broad stocks. Come on, let's be real. Next week, it's another big week for eco data. CPI is due on Wednesday, along with the FOMC announcement. The PPI is not due until Thursday, post the FOMC announcement. The S&P and NASDAQ continue to hug and kiss the 70 lines on the RSI chart, right? Relative strength chart, suggesting that we're approaching an overbought condition, and that usually suggests a pullback is near. Again, while we're not knocking on death's door, uh, there's no reason to panic. Evidence is building, though, that the economy is starting to slow. So let's just see how this uh, how this plays out today, what today's data brings, right? Call me to discuss it. You know, I'm always happy to talk to you about long-term plans and helping you create long-term and generational wealth. Um, so give me a buzz. Look me up. You can find me, Slate Stone Wealth. Okay, so now, uh, what do we have for dinner tonight? This isn't really dinner, but this is kind of a kind of a, a versatile summer salad that you could use all summer long. It's fresh, it's good, it's cool, it's it's uh, it's easy to make, right? And it works well, really, with any summer dish you want to make, whether it's chicken, fish, steak, hamburgers, whatever. For this, you just need cherry tomatoes, which you're going to slice in half. You need fresh cucumbers, red onion. You need an avocado or two, feta cheese, a splash of olive oil, salt and pepper, and a squirt of fresh lemon juice. You want to cut the cucumbers in half and then cut them in half again, and now slice them into small little bite-sized pieces, right? Mix that... Uh, uh, take the mix that with the sliced tomatoes. So take the cucumbers, slice up the, the cherry tomatoes, um, and some diced red onion. Add in the sliced avocado, season it with salt and pepper, a splash of olive oil, and now some crumbled feta cheese, and then uh, a squirt of fresh lemon juice. Place it in the fridge. Remove it 10 minutes before you want to eat it, just so that it's not ice ice cold, um, but it's still cool to the taste. And anyway. Uh, it's a great dish. It's a great summer dish, easy to make it. You can, you can make it the day before and have it sitting in your fridge. It's great, you don't have to worry about it. Um, it lasts, you know, probably two days max. If you make it on Monday, by Wednesday, you gotta eat it. Uh, beyond Wednesday, it starts to get, you know, the tomatoes start to get mushy and like, ah, you don't wanna do it. But you know, make it on Monday, eat it. Monday, Tuesday, and, and Wednesday for lunch. In any event, <laughs> look, the sun is out, it's Friday, everything's good. I, I could live in uh, a lot of places and this place is just fine. Until Monday, take good care.